Welcome to the Green Yard Reaction for Chem 252. Today you'll be starting off with bromobenzene, the liquid. We're going to react it with magnesium metal, which is very unusual to have organics react with the metal. And we're going to make from this what we call a Green Yard reagent, where the magnesium will insert itself in between the carbon and the halogen. And this is known as the Green Yard reagent. And this is what most of the lab will be about, is creating this species. Your solvent will be ether. You want to be careful with this because it's highly flammable, but it needs to be then in diethyl ether. And for Grignard, what we mainly wanted to realize is that this species is actually more of a carbanion, where the magnesium donates all of its electron density to the benzene ring. And we have this anion here. So this is really what the Grignard is, is this a very strong nucleophile carbon with a minus charge. So this is step number one. And this will, again, will take anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours to make, just depending on the conditions. But once you generate the Green Yard reaction, our step two, which is very interesting, will be reacting your Green Yard reagent with dry ice, or CO2. And this will be in the solid version of being extremely cold, but this will, is considered an electrophile. This is a very strong nucleophile. So what will happen is when this reacts with CO2, we'll get this arrow pushing, and we'll make a new carbon-carbon bond to the carbon and the carbon dioxide, and we'll be, make the deprotonated version of benzoic acid from this reaction. Um, at this point here, this will still be um, not quite the form we want. We do want to end up making benzoic acid itself, the protonated version. So step number three, we'll simply add hydrochloric acid. That will grab that proton. And lo and behold, we will have benzoic acid solid. And you will have made this from scratch, this material from the bromobenzene and the magnesium. And that'll be our reaction for the day. Um, first off, we'll show you the setup for this step here. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that since this is a very strong nucleophile, it's also a very strong base, we have to watch out for water. This is an important side reaction that the Grignard reagent, being a very strong base, is such a strong base, even water looks like an acid to it. If water is present, we'll deprotonate, and we will create benzene from our benzoic acid, hydroxide, but we will destroy our Grignard reagent before we can react with the CO2. So right off the bat, what we're going to do is to ensure that we don't have any water present, because we're going to flame dry all the, the glass where we'll be using to make sure we drive all the water from the glass. And we also will be using very dry ether, and our reaction setup will have a drying tube on it to prevent water from getting in the reaction. Right, so let's get to flame drying first off. So this is our glassware for the Grignard reagent, a round bottom flask. It's called the Claisen head, and then our drying tube adapter on top. Now before we start the reaction, we need to flame dry the glassware because we want to make sure that all of the water that is embedded in the glassware is driven out of it. So we're gonna Catch all this. We have our nice blue flame going. We got some prongs. Now, flame drying glass where the idea is to um, get the glass fairly hot so all the water is driven off. And it's hard to tell like when you're completely done. I've always viewed this as like I'm painting the glassware with the flame, going over and over. In a certain respect, you can't really overdo it. So if, if you spend maybe an extra 30 seconds doing doing this, that's really not a loss. In, doing that. You don't want it to get blistering red hot, however. That should actually be enough for that. So this round bottom now is considered to be fairly dry, and I'll set that down. This will be where it'll be hot for a while. I'll take the drying tube. And again, I just think I'm, I'm painting this with a blue flame. 
Ideally, you want a nice blue flame that's a lot harder than yellow flame. And sort of near the tip is a real nice hot spot for that. That's probably good. And now the glazing condenser. Torch this really well. And everything. At this point, when you flame dry, of course, you do not want your ether solvent anywhere near the flame. The ether fumes can travel quite a distance and ignite. And so when we have the flame out, we want the ether sealed up and put away. It's probably the biggest safety concern we have for this lab. Jim wasn't kidding when he said the open flame and ether don't mix. Here's a little demo, and you can see I'm all the way on the other side of the bench from that open flame with my ether. I'm very happy to be all the way on the other side of the bench from it now. We're going to add the 0.8 mils of bromo benzene to the 5 mil conical vial. And then we're going to add 4 mils of ether. And then this solution we will add to the reaction apparatus shown here. A little quick tour we have a drying tube with calcium chloride in it for the desiccant. So air can go in and go out, but it will dehydrate the air. And then we're going to inject the bromo benzene ether solution through this septa here with a syringe. And this will ensure that we lessen the amount of water that we introduce into the system. Because right now we're, we're, we're kind of watertight as it stands. solution and this will pretty much fill the top of your 5 mil conical vial so I'm not being terribly accurate but we'll be close enough once I've done this we want to seal this back up to keep it dry and seal our All right now we're ready to so add our um, bromobenzene to our magnesium. We're going to add it using a syringe. This is our bromobenzene and ether solution. I'm going to add this through the septa. And we'll be adding this solution throughout the experiment. We're going to first start off with adding about one milliliter of this solution, about a quarter of it to start with. Go through the top of the septa. Now we slowly drip our ether solution down to the magnesium. Start a very slow stir. We have this stir bar inside. Cap our solution so it remains dry. And this way we agitate the magnesium just a little bit to make sure that the surface is getting exposed to the, the bromobenzene. And we can also add a little bit of heat from the hot plate. We just we don't want direct heat, we just want this to be kind of warm. Um, ether boils at 35, so we need hardly any heat at all, but enough heat wafting from the hot plate should be enough to gently warm the solution, and that'll help to get it to react. Now at this point, what we're waiting for, over time, the solution should turn a little bit cloudy and a little bit of a, a light brown color. The more intense brown it gets, the more grignard that we're making. Again, this could take anywhere from about 15 minutes to about two hours. It can be a very slow reaction. So for now, we'll wait and hope for the best. So this is a good sign. See how the solution is getting a little bit cloudy? And this is an indication that the reaction has started and we'll keep stirring and hopefully it'll get a little bit more cloudy and a little darker as time goes on. So I think we're on our way. And here we're doing pretty well, see the darker color. The, the bubbling is bubbling on its own heat. It's an exothermic reaction and it's refluxing on its own accord. That is looking really good. This sort of grignard looks like when it's moving on. Again, we have probably another 
know, 15 minutes to a half hour to let this come to completion, we will also want to look for the magnesium chips to get smaller and smaller as they dissolve to make the grignard. But so far, we're looking really good. getting pretty near the end. Um, we're not boiling quite as readily as we were, but the solution is a nice dark brown color. We've consumed some magnesium, and I've added almost all of our, our bromobenzene. We'll maybe finish this off. This will be the last of the bromobenzene solution. And once we do this, we'll wait about five minutes or so for the reaction all right, I'm now we're ready to pour over dry ice. ice. Our reaction did pretty well with this. Seat. Now the next step will be so to we'll pour this down over dry ice. This the CO2 is job keeping. And then we'll get our step two reaction. Water out. Disengage. So now I've got my my Grignard solution, nice dark brown solution. I'm going to add this to this is dry ice, and it's in the solid form. It's CO2. And this reaction takes place immediately. I'll just sort of pipe that in our nice Grignard solution. Lots of, part of that is dry ice um, evaporating as the warm ether hits it. But we're also carrying out our reaction. And we have excess dry ice in there, so it won't all disappear. Look at that beautiful solution. Now we can maybe stir this up a little bit. So what we have here is, you see this is almost a, a little bit gummy. And this is what the, the deprotonated benzoic acid, this is the form it is in. It's sort of a, a gooey type of compound. And there we go. And we're still losing a little bit of dry ice, but that looks like a really good yield. A little bit of ethers left over, but that looks scrumptious. And then the next step to this is that we can add HCl and now protonate it to form the benzoic acid. But this was the hard part of the job. We got our molecule. There we go. So we're on our last step. We have our Grignard. All the dry ice is sublimed. We have a little bit of ether in our gummy residue. Remember, this is the deprotonated benzoic acid. So I'm going to protonate it with 6 molar HCl. And you're going to add roughly 5 mils to this. So this will reprotonate it. We won't see much change at this point. And so the HCl is an aqueous system. Stir this up a little bit to make sure everything reacts. And here you get the sense that there might be two layers here. The top layer is the remaining ether and the bottom layer is the HCl. And we just want to make sure all of our product is contacting the acid so it gets a chance to protonate. So now once it's protonated, we want to ask ourselves where will our, will our benzoic acid be? And the benzoic acid, now that it has a proton, is, is a, a neutral molecule, should be in the upper ether layer. I'm going to add more ether so it, there's more solvent space there so that the our product can dissolve into that ether. The bottom layer is the HCl. The HCl will be containing a lot of the um, magnesium salt products up a little bit. There you go. So magnesium salts will be in the lower aqueous layer. Upper ether layer will be our benzoic acid as well as our main byproduct biphenyl should also be in this layer. And later we'll need to separate those two. But for now I'm, I'm going to separate these layers. We'll use our separatory funnel. And I'll pour this in. Let's see our two layers. 
separating nicely. Sometimes it's, it's actually okay to do a, one more little shake and stir to make sure that everything goes into the right layer. Always want to vent, especially with ether, to vent off the pressure buildup of the ether. We'll set this back. We've still got our two layers, maybe a little bit hard to see, but we do have an upper layer of the ether, that's where our product is, don't throw that away, and the bottom layer is the HCL. And let's just drain off the lower HCL layer, we don't need it. And we'll just collect the bottom layer here in our beaker, and we'll have the ether layer remaining. Try and stop it right at the interface. Right where the ether and the water interface is, we'll cut the draining. There we go. Alright, we'll stop for here knowing that our product is in the ether mixed with biphenyl. The next two steps, which we won't do, but we would extract the sodium hydroxide to extract out the benzoic acid, separate it from the ether, and then Reacidify the, the aqueous sodium hydroxide layer and our benzoic acid product will precipitate out at that point. And thank you very much. I'm glad this worked out so well.